once again, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar on designing and analyzing TSFs using numerical methods. My name is Reginald Hammer, and I'm with Rock Science in Africa. I'm joined today by my colleague in Canada, Dr. Ali Reza Azam. I'm going to invite him to start sharing some thoughts with us, and then I'll continue thereafter. Ali Reza, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Reginald. Before uh, anything, we will have uh, a webinar on uh, Norsen. We are planning it. Uh, we haven't announced the exact date yet, but uh, we are letting you know that we are working on it. The webinar is going to be on Norsen. And uh, it has its application. Uh, we will be using our tools RS2. Like, for example, there are examples on construction of new embankments on a tailing dam, and we will look at effect of building this new embankment, this yellow embankment is going to be the new embankment coming into the model. We will be solving it, like I'm showing you here, with a coupled bioformulation, the north end material model, and we will be investigating the stability of these tailing dams, like you're looking at initial condition for poor water pressure, excess poor water pressure that we will have after the building of this new layer of embankment. So you can see huge, big numbers for prediction of excess poor water pressure because of that. And we will look at the stability of this. We will look at the effect of initial state parameter in this material model. Like for example, when everything is the same between these three materials that you are looking at, these are showing you uh, undrained three axial tests on these three sands. Every material property is the same. The only thing that is different is that the state parameter. So this is the denser one, this is the looser one. And uh, you can see the effect that this parameter has on the generation of excess pore water pressure. If I show you in uh, our stata, for example, uh, this is the loose material, the red color. If I'm animating the stress class for that one, you can see that in an undrained triaxial test, it will generate lots of excess pore water pressure. It's moving towards uh, the origin that's going to liquefy. And if you're looking at the other one, looking at the denser material, and they animate the stress path. You have some generation of excess for water pressure at the beginning, but after a certain time, the dilation behavior kicks in and you have negative for water pressure generated and you have the, the material can accept higher level of shear stress. So uh, going back to the presentation, and uh, then we will look at the effect of these parameters on the stability of a couple of examples. Like this one is uh, looking at that material, the north end material, the tailing material being at the looser state and you are looking at the generation of big numbers for the excess pore water pressure. And because of this, you will see instability in that region. These are the contours of distortion, for example, here I'm showing you, and which is an indication of failure surface. And also you're looking at total displacement. So this is in plan. We are working on the examples and uh, more material to put together to present to you in that webinar. Okay, uh, now I'll pass it to you, pass it back to you, Reginald for today's webinar. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, Ali Reza. I'm now going to share my screen. What we are going to do today is actually have a conversation about these tools. But we'll also look at an example. We'll look at simple overview of the processes for building some of these numerical models to look at different situations. So I'll take you through this short PowerPoint where we'll discuss the role of numerical methods in our design of tailing storage facilities. After we are done that, I mean, we'll discuss um, how do we complement our traditional or conventional limit equilibrium analysis with numerical methods. Then once we are done, I'll take an example that has already been built in slide two, the rock science 2D limit equilibrium program. We'll see how we can readily bring it into RS2, which is the finite element program that you can use to support your TSM design. So we'll bring it into RS2. We'll run a simple stability analysis. So it mimics or simulates a factor safety analysis just as we would do with um, limit equilibrium methods. And we'll compare our numerical method answer to the limit equilibrium. Just briefly so we can see that there's a good uh, correlation between the answers. We'll learn to interpret some of the results of numerical methods because it's a little bit more elaborate than limit equilibrium. Then we'll try and add a coupled analysis, which Ali Reza is going to do 
in much more detail when he does the Norsan course. And then he'll be focusing on Norsan. But we'll see how it's, you generally set it up in RS2. Then after that, I'll also do, if we have time, we'll try and see the results for a dynamic analysis. We may not see the results, but at least we'll see how to build it and run it so that we get, if we're doing seismic assessments of TSFs, we could also use the software to do that. So by the end of the day, what I'm hoping is you would have seen a good overview of the whole process of how we build these models. We can build them from scratch just as we do in limited equilibrium. But to save time, I will import from limited equilibrium. But we'll see how these two complement uh, limited equilibrium analysis. So that's what we are going to do today. So one of the things is because of recent high profile incidents with tailings, it is becoming more important to use um, finite element methods and numerical methods for the analysis. So we'll look at some of the recent uh, innovations in RS2, which allow us to do the work that we need to do. And we can also see, as we interpret the results, we'll see how these methods capture a fair, you know, quite realistic behavior of TSFs, different aspects from the tailings themselves all the way through to the foundations, through the embankments. I mean, every aspect of that behavior is well captured in these methods. So we we'll look at, like I said, consequences of what why we have to do a lot of what we are discussing today. And we'll just briefly look at slow stability analysis, just so we can see how limit equilibrium and numerical analysis complement each other. So we all know TSFs, there are these geotechnical structures that we build and the idea is to safely store mine with tailings. The interesting thing about these structures is they must be safe and work very well during mining operations and even after operations, they are typically closed and they exist for several decades, well after mining has ceased. So we need to design them to work well throughout all of these phases. And the phases are changing, the loading, the conditions for these phases are changing. That is what calls for a lot of skill in our work to make sure that what we design will last for the foreseeable future. So being able to analyze and design them and anticipates conditions that will be occurring is key to our success. Because of the recent uh, events that we've had, we had Bromadino, we had Samarco, we had Mount Poly, and a few others. There's been a big push for us to prove that the dams we are working with, either we are designing or that already exists, that we oversee or so help our clients um, oversee are indeed going to be safe or stable. So regulators, governments, investors, the general public, they're asking their mine companies who are the owners, um, you know, different practitioners, design engineers, we are all being called upon to prove the stability of our TSFs. Now, when we talk about numerical methods, I don't want us to walk away thinking that we need numerical methods for everything. That's not what we're seeing. We need them for a lot and we can do a lot with them. But I also want us to see that it's not at every stage of a project that we may need to rely on numerical methods. For example, at the beginning, scoping level, pre-feasibility level, where we have very little data, it may not be necessary to run numerical analysis because we just don't have the data. But as we get closer to the detailed design, as we go into operation, we surely must have enough information so that we can use these methods. Now, as we also said, TSFs are always evolving. Yeah, there are geometry changes. There are raises. Uh, we add embankments to certain as parts of it in order to increase the volume of storage. Um, we change the location of the pond. We try to use the position to plan the location of the pond. Depending on the type of dam, we may well have to keep the pond far away from the face. These are all things that we constantly have to do. Um, when mining is done or even when mining is not about a particular tsf is closed it's come to the end of its life we still have to control pore pressures we still have to watch over surface water inflow inflows in order to make sure that the facility will remain safe so we do that and then when it's closed we still generally have to do something before it's closed to make sure that when it's done it will not need as much intervention to keep things safe we would have designed um, water diversion measures or different things to just to make sure that when the facility is closed, it will work.
But all of these things require us to do significant levels of analysis. So that is why we need these numerical methods. The other challenge we are facing today is there's a lot of TSF work that has to be done. We'll describe some of the reasons why. But we don't have as many people who know how to use these tools very well. So one of the things we are trying to do is broaden the skill space through these webinars. We want to help broaden the skill space so that more and more people can use these tools in their work. So just general things that affect the stability of TSFs. You have your site conditions, your topography, and you know, um, the relief surrounding the TSF, the geology, the foundation conditions, the hydrogeology. We need to understand the seismicity of the area in order to be able to design the dam well. We need to know the embankment construction materials, which materials are we using, and uh, the characteristics of the tailings themselves. These are things we need to understand. We need to understand inflows of water into the facility and outflows. So surface water is very important. So currently we use limited equilibrium methods, mostly, mostly, not all, but mostly. We are beginning to use numerical methods more and more. Limited equilibrium methods generally calculate factors of safety under different conditions and different loads. And then when we do the analysis, we also look at the failure surface associated with the minimum factor of safety values that we get. And these are critical inputs that we use in our design. So especially at the scoping level, previous where we may not have a lot of data, we use limited equilibrium methods a lot. And there's another reason why we use limited equilibrium methods. They have been around for a long time. And we'll see that. Now, they have a few shortcomings. We'll discuss them. These are one of the primary things is they do not look at deformations. They assume the material to be essentially rigid. So as a result, we cannot model that. We cannot model interactions between stresses and poor pressures. Numerical methods are better suited for that. That's why we said when we get to the more mature stages of design or when the facilities already exist, and we have much more information available. It is expedient to use numerical methods. We've known better equilibrium methods for about 70 years now. So they are industry standard. We have a lot of experience with them. They are relatively simple to understand, fast to run, don't require too many parameters. So that's great. That's one of the reasons we use them at the beginning in the early stages, because we get enough information to use them and they give us enough information to guide us in our choices. So that works very well. And they have some limitations. Um, you know, they essentially the materials are rich, they are perfectly plastic. So what happens is, for example, if you want you have a peak strength and post-peak strength or residual strength that is significantly lower than the peak strength, you can't use both values in one limited equilibrium assessment. You have to use one or the other. That's one of the limitations. Of the method and because we don't get informations um, sometimes just factor safety is not good enough and in fact in some of the quotes especially when you're looking at seismic stability they don't even want us to really uh, use limited equilibrium they want us to use numerical methods so we are being forced to do stress deformation analysis using numerical methods a lot that's where the trend is and that's one of the reasons why we are trying to equip ourselves with the knowledge today so we can use uh, these methods more. One of the critical differences between them and limited equilibrium methods is they give us ideas on deformations. There are stress distributions uh, a bit more realistic than we have in limited equilibrium because of the assumptions that we need to make in limited equilibrium to get statically determined uh, systems which we can solve. So the numerical methods are a bit more sophisticated, but they give us a lot more information as well. And it can also give us factor of safety. So the first example we run today, we'll look at factor of safety. Now, so we can look at a large number of parameters can be input into numerical methods. We can look at staged construction, um, complex geometries, all of those things. We spoke about peak, post-peak strength of a material. All in one analysis, we can accommodate that in numerical methods. And the key two main ones we use for TSFs, these are not the only numerical methods, but in TSF design and analysis, it's usually the finite element method or the finite difference method. RS2, RS3, the rock science products are finite element methods. They are based on the finite element. So numerical methods are becoming more mature as we 
or use them more, talk about them more, write more papers about them, give more sem seminars and webinars on them, workshops. It's becoming a much more mature technology. And like we said, it can calculate factors of safety using a technique called the shear strength reduction method. Unlike limited equilibrium methods, numerical methods look for the critical mechanism. You don't have to assume circular, non-circular locations. You can just allow the model to run and it will determine the most critical mechanisms. And like we said, it does the full stress strain, uh, behavior, the stress deformation, characteristics of all the materials can be taken into consideration in numerical methods. When you have uh, residual strength that is significantly lower than peak strength, which is typically characterized as brittle materials, you can accommodate that. Uh, Ali Reza mentioned critical state soil mechanics at the beginning and the state parameter. All of these things can be taken into account in numerical methods. You can't do the same in the limited equilibrium analysis. And you can also do coupled hydromechanic responses where loading leads to temporary increases in pore pressures that dissipate with time. So we got consolidation behavior. All of these things can be modeled by the uh, numerical methods. And we so we can get deformations and deformation patterns, which are very useful for us. Um, the material behavior themselves can go from the very simple to the very complicated. And looking at all those things we told, and Ali Reza mentioned uh, contracted materials, dilated materials, all of these characteristics we can implement, we can model in numerical methods. Nonlinear material behavior. So these are things we can do. Now, one of the things is power comes at a price. So the power finite element method, as we've said, is powerful. Stresses, displacement, pore pressures, excess pore pressures, all of these things we can. Uh, measure and analyze, but the generality comes at a price. It's more sophisticated, it's more intricate. We need to invest time to understand. So we are very glad that several people have joined us today to help us understand what these tools are and how to use them. And they can also take longer to run and they can take more men, depending on what we are trying to do. So we must be aware of that when we are using them. So I'm just going to look at a simple example. I'll first go to slide two. I have an example we constructed from a well-known case with some modifications. It's just to simulate an upstream dam. We're just looking at the factor of safety of this dam. So I've already run it. And that is the Morgan Stanford price factor of safety, 1.44. The um, Spencer is about the same, 1.45. Bishop was slightly lower. But these are the factors of safety we got from limit equilibrium analysis. The pinkish line is the phreatic surface. The contours we are seeing are just a pressure head contours. So that's what we are looking at. Now, if we want to use RS2 to run a model like this, it's relatively straightforward. What we do is, and I'm going to start it almost afresh, but in terms of running it, I've already run it, so we'll go and see the results. But what you do is you go to file, you go to import, and there's an option to import slide files. So let me choose import a slide file. And this is the original uh, slide file I had, or oh, I can even open this one, it's the same, exact same file. When I choose it, RS2, the idea is we want to make it easy for you to use the tool. Once you set up all of this, it is also quite easy to change material properties try different things. So when you first bring it in, it will ask you whether you want to turn on the strength reduction uh, method automatically so that you can calculate factors of safety. In that case, it will need to mesh the model, create a finite element mesh and then compute. So I'll just choose yes. So once I choose that, this is it. It has come up with that model and it has the same strength properties as I had in my limited equilibrium analysis. The key difference between this model and what I had in my slide analysis is that here, if I right click on any property, so right now I right click on the tailings and I go to material properties, I see that there is a stiffness tab. This we did not have in limit equilibrium analysis. We just had strength. So when I come to the stiffness, I can assign different stiffnesses to the materials. If I import it directly from slide, what it does is 
since we don't have this information from slide, it assumes all the materials to have the same stiffness parameters. So when I change all the different materials, you see Poisson's ratio, Young's bond loss is exactly the same. So that allows you to quickly match your limit equilibrium analysis. However, it does not mean that the finite element analysis must stay the same. This is just preliminary. We can now come in and add the real or measured stiffness characteristics of the materials, and that can lead to deviations from what you see from the limit equilibrium method. But these deviations are good. They are helpful. They are useful. They give us a more intricate picture of what is happening with our models. So this is something these methods can do. I also mentioned that they also allow you to specify post-peak or residual strength. So right now, by default, when you import from slide, you have the same peak strength as the residual strength. Essentially, you have elastic, perfectly plastic material behavior. But that is not always true. If your material is brittle, if the residual strengths are lower, I can come here and assign those lower results and it will be reflected in the stability that I calculate. So these methods are very powerful. They require more information, but the good news is there are certain assumptions that make them almost equivalent to limit equilibrium analysis. So they can be a good check on your limit equilibrium methods as well. Because you know in limit equilibrium analysis, we are we always debate over which methods to use. Now it is considered good practice to also run a limit a numerical analysis such as what we are doing and check the results to see how it compares to your limit equilibrium result. So I can save this a run. It takes only about two or three minutes for this to run. But I'll go and look at interpretation of the results. So when I run it and I go into RS2 and I click interpret, up comes the screen and I see my phreatic surface for the model that I had specified. And by default, it's showing me contours of maximum shear strength. Now, it also shows me what is labeled as critical SRF, critical strength reduction factor. This is what is equivalent to the factor of safety. So the factor of safety of this loop from RS2 is 1.4. In my limit equilibrium analysis, and I'll go to it. Remember, we saw the answers were around 1.45. So this has come quite close to the limit equilibrium result. We can go and do more sophisticated analysis with this, like we said, chain residual strength, chain stiffnesses, and see how that leads to changes. So that's something we can do. It does not significantly, especially when it comes to the stiffness parameters, they may not significantly change the factor of safety, but your mode of failure, your mode of deformation can change substantially. So it can be a very helpful tool to give us additional insights as to how things will behave. Bands of maximum shear strain give us an idea of the failure mechanism. So when I go to these higher reduction factors, you see more and more pronounced shear bands. So we get a better and better idea of the failure mechanism. And the thing is at stage for the reduction factor of one, which is essentially your base state, um, you know, you start measuring things from there and from that point onwards, you're getting more and more shear bands forming until a full band forms and that essentially creates the mechanism of failure. That's one way of looking at results. We could also have gone to displacements and looked at total displacement. Total displacement contours are also a very valuable picture of what is of the failure mechanism. So if I go to my first tab, which is the base state, this is the base material strength. We use that as a base, so everything is set to zero. Everything, all deformations are measured from this state. That's why it's zero here. At 1.3, you're getting these deformations. And then at these higher factors, you get a much more pronounced deformation pattern compared to the rest of the model. Most of it is zero. This zone is a zone of failure, the zone that is moving. We can change the scales, so the scales for all of the stages are the same to give us an even better idea. So let me just right click, choose contour options, auto range all stages. So I'm using the same skill for all the stages. And uh, I could have changed, let me change the maximum, or I can even change to a custom. And let me make this, let's say 1.2 and let me apply and see, all right? Maybe that's too high. Let me just try one and apply. I like that better. And I'll say done to close it. So now all my stages are using. Now here is so much higher that the contour is even gone out of range. But and here it's completely gone. But at stage one, uh, at the first tab, second tab, third tab. So now I can actually see 
the progress of the mechanism as it forms until it fully forms right at this, right after we pass uh, the 1.4 reduction factor bar. So this is something you can do with a um, numerical methods that is very helpful. I can animate this picture, but before I animate it, let me just show deform boundaries. So it's just an option in Iris 2. You can also show de deform boundaries or deform contours, or you can turn on both of them. They also help you get a better idea of the failure mechanism. So here, this is the base state. Everything is starting from here. You see a mechanism forming. This is exaggerated. Okay, these are exaggerated images of the mechanism until it is um, formed and you can control the stage of or the scale of exaggeration so these are things that you can do with limit of numerical methods that give us good insight into how the mechanism will form in our particular case it starts from the toe and then heads towards the crest so you see bulging in the toe these are all things that are measurable so that's another thing with numerical methods because they give deformations you can almost calibrate them to field measurements so that's something we can see. You can also animate what you just did. Let me just click animate tabs and it will just animate this mechanism or the, these uh, pictures that we're looking at, which gives us further insight into how our slope behaves. So very helpful. Now, the next thing we are going to do, so we've looked at this, we could have looked at stresses. I mean, there are several things we could do, but we are happy with this. Let us, just as we saw with, the limited equilibrium method, which, by the way, uses the same seepage analysis engine as RS2 does. So the seepage analysis engine in slide two is a finite element-based module. And that's exactly the same module you find in RS2. But we could look at pore pressures, so I can go to uh, seepage and look at uh, pore pressures, and I can see pore pressures in my model. So that's the first simple example that we wanted to look at. Now let's go back to the model in RX2, where the model was actually built and run. And when I brought it here, I did not show you the groundwater conditions, boundary conditions, but they exist. And these were the same boundary conditions we had applied in the limit equilibrium analysis. Now, what we are going to do is, we're going to say, okay, so let's say we're happy with this. Next, we want to do is, we want to do some coupled analysis. In my case, I've already finished building the embankment. It's at its ultimate height. Once we do a couple of analysis, we are looking at some transient changes, some time changes. So the only time change thing that changes in the current model I'm going to build is lowering of the phreatic surface, just to create a different um, loading condition. And we'll see how with time, stresses and pore pressures change for this particular problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the coupled view. I'm going to add a few more stages so that I, I can run a transient analysis, and we're going to see the change in pore pressures with time, given the coupling with stress. So let's try that. So all I have to do is go to project settings. Under my general tab, I will change from conservation option. For the default option we created when we imported from slide, it was set to be none. Now let's change it to couple. And then it tells us, when you do couple, you cannot combine it with dynamic analysis, but that's okay for us. And do we want to accept these changes? You say yes. And groundwater must be sent to transient. So we say that's fine. We'll make these choices. So if we go to groundwater, it is now on transient. So now let's go to stages. And what I am going to do is I am going to set the number of stages uh, to, let's say, five stages. I think that's what I do. So let me change it to five stages. And I have five stages added and i could name the stages but just to save time i am not going to name them but all of these are the transient stages so another thing i can do is right now my time is in seconds i want to measure my time in days how do i change that i can go to the general time and where it says time units i will change it to days for this example it's easier for me to use this so now i can go to my stages and i'll say my first stage is uh, one day after I quickly lower the water table, my next stage is uh, my best try uh, five days after. The next stage is 30 days after. And the last stage is, let's say, 365 days a year after the quick lowering of the phreatic surface. What will happen? And I could appropriately name the stages, but I'll leave that out for now. And I would say, okay. So now I have my starting stage uh, or st steady state condition which had a certain elevation of uh, water pressure, uh, water head on the rightmost boundary. 
Now we change it. So when I come to this stage, I need to specify my transient uh, change in the pore pressures. So to do that, I can go to, um, I am in my groundwater and what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the phreatic surface, the level. So I'll click boundary conditions and I'll also right click and change the selection filter. So it selects only external boundaries, okay? And on my right boundary, I am going to select all of these. And this time I think I lowered the head by 10 meters. So it is going to be, um, let me just check the value. It was 742, so 732. Let me make it 732 as the head and I'll apply it to that. And on this side, I'm still going to, I, I think I use zero pressure boundary conditions. So I'll select zero pressure boundary conditions, select this area, apply those. And um, oh, no, sorry, let me uh, undo that part. Let me close it and let me undo so I can redo that. Um, again, let me go to groundwater, select the boundary conditions. What I didn't do was my selection filter, change it to external boundary only. I've selected zero pressure. Let me just select these nodes, apply. So that way, it applies it only to the external boundary, doesn't apply to the material boundaries. That is why I changed the selection filter. And then I'm going to make these unknown boundary conditions, the face of the dam. So I am going to select this whole area and I will, ah, I didn't do my, apply my filter again. So let me close, let me save my file in the meantime, save it and let's give it that name. Okay, let me go back there, uh, choose to unknown, right click selection filter, make sure material boundaries off. Okay, so then I can now select all of this, select only the surface, I apply the unknown to that. Seepage boundary condition is the other name for it. And now this is good enough. So at this stage, I rapidly lower the water level and then these, um, this is just time dependent changes that will be occurring. How will the pore pressure change once we make those changes. Again, I've saved and run that already for us. And so anybody who is interested, just ask us, we'll give you these files so you can practice with them yourself and verify things for yourself, or at least use them as a base to learn how to build other models. But when I go into the interpreter, let me go into my results for that. For now, let's just look at uh, excess pore pressure. So stage one, that is my steady state, so there's no excess pore pressure. Once I quickly lowered it, these are my excess pore pressures. After one day, after five days, after 30 days, after 365, one of the things you will notice is the phreatic surface. This was the original. When we rapidly lowered it, this is what it was. It was still high. It is lowering with time, but it hasn't come down fully yet, and it is coming up. And we can play with the boundary conditions as well. But this is something that we briefly created just to show you the concept of how you can model excess pore pressure changes um, using the coupled hydromechanical module in or options in RS2. So that's another thing we've done and we're happy with it. The last thing I'm going to do with this same model is what if I wanted to run a dynamic analysis? I wanted to simulate an earthquake, which is something that, uh, especially at detailed um, design phases in highly seismic environments, we have to do. So to do that, I will just tell you one thing. Seismic analysis does not work with uh, currently dynamic and uh, sorry, dynamic, which is seismic analysis and coupled analysis do not work together. It's one or the other. So I'll go back into my project settings. So I'll go back to RS2, starting with that model. I'll go into project settings and I will turn off my coupled, I'll go to NAT because I cannot combine coupled with dynamic. So I can do that. I can go to the dynamic uh, option and turn it off. This now allows me to run dynamic analysis. We have very good uh, tutorials on the dynamic analysis, how you can establish your alpha and N from the natural frequencies of the system. I encourage you to go and look at those tutorials. So for now, I'm just going to leave these parameters. I will run them. But if you want to know how to use uh, set different damping ratios or relevant damping ratios for your model, I encourage you to look at the tutorials. You will be able to learn how to do that quite quickly. So um, I've done this, and then I also turn off strength reduction. Uh, in fact, I think I turned it off earlier. So you turn off strength reduction because otherwise that will increase my the length of time. But if I wanted to do strength reduction analysis 
it will do it on the very last stage. It always does this on the last stage of whatever multi-stage model you have created. So in my particular model, if I were to leave things at like this, it would have run it at stage five. But, um, we're going to add a few more stages. We're going to add three more stages to this, okay? So that's the other thing. I make sure it's turned off, dynamic is turned on, and then I'll go to stages. I just up, up until this time, up to stage five, everything was static. But now I say, let's say after that final stage where things were to 365, an earthquake hit, or let's say an earthquake hit two years later. How are we going to model that? So what we do is let's change the number of stages. I'll just add three more stages. So it will go from five to eight. And then I'm going to change this. So this I want to occur two years after that last stage, an earthquake hits the dam. Now, the only thing is, remember, we are going to check what happens to the dam, and it takes seconds. The changes occur over seconds. Now I set my time to days. So that means I must make sure that everything is set to seconds. So I believe for five seconds, I have to make this 730.123458. I believe that's five seconds. Okay. And then um, 20 seconds or 30 seconds later, I'll change this to 730 point, and that is 0035. That is roughly 30 seconds later. So I'm chosen to look at what happens immediately when seismic states. Five seconds after it hits, 30 seconds after it hits. These last stages are the dynamic stages, so I select them as dynamic. And I select OK. And I'm almost set up to run. The only other things left for me to do, set the dynamic boundary conditions, set the dynamic load, and it should be good to go. Now, sometimes we debate, should I run this with this? The properties I have right now are not the dynamic soil properties. I leave it up to you, the experts, but you could change the soil properties. You've seen how we can do that. We can input a different set for to simulate dynamic conditions and run the model. But we've done the stages. The next thing we need to do is we'll change our displacement so that at these stages, we will have dynamic displacements uh, at well, when we get to the dynamic stages, okay? So uh, when I am at my static stages, I want to see these static boundary conditions. But when I go to dynamic, I shouldn't see these fixed. So that is what I'm going to try and do next. To do that, I have to go to my displacements and I will first, I will free all the displacements. I'm going to uh, select all the boundaries and apply, okay? I freed all the displacements. Now I'm going to do is such that from stages one to five it's fixed. Six to eight, it now goes into the dynamic mode and it just has it will have only dynamic boundary conditions. So I'll choose displacement. Let me put one and one for the X and Y displacements. But I will stage the displacements and I will use stage factors. And I will say from stages one to five, the factor is zero. So essentially it's fixed. There's no displacement of the nodes. Zero times any number is zero. So this essentially fixes all of that. Then once I go into the dynamic, I'll release them. So I free them so that they will be, I'll see the dynamic impulse and how it affects my slope. And I'll select OK. And I will apply, apply them. To, so let me change my selection filter. Let me make sure it's on the external boundary. And I'll select uh, this boundary. And these boundaries, in fact, here I could have just drawn. Yes, it's selected them and that and apply and close. So if I go here, these are fixed here. And then once I go to dynamic, they will only the dynamic boundary conditions will apply. And let me save my model. So I have done that as well for the displacements. Now I need to specify a dynamic load and dynamic boundary conditions. These are the two things left for me to do, and I'll be ready to run my model. So in terms of dynamic boundary conditions. We typically set these vertical sites are set to have um, transmit boundary conditions. So if I go to dynamic boundary conditions, uh, dynamic tab, I go to dynamic boundary conditions. Again, I, I'll change this to transmit. I'll change the selection filter to um, external boundary so that uh, and I'll select OK so I can draw and select only the external boundary and apply transmit. Um, I hope this is also a vertical boundary 
this is because it's not exactly vertical. I can change it to make it exactly vertical. I had done it in the second, um, in the change I had made so I could run it. It has to be perfectly vertical. It's not perfectly vertical when I set up the model. So I would have to change it, but that's easy. I can change it and do it, apply the transmit and it all works. Okay. And then the, I would now have to change to absorb, make sure again, my selection filter is only external and I will apply my absorb only to the horizontal, not to these sides. I'll apply my absorb to that boundary and I'll select close. So barring that this is not perfectly vertical, so I was not able to apply the transmit. This would be set up as far as the boundary conditions go. Then the last thing I need to do is specify my dynamic load and then apply it. So to define the load, I go into the tab, I will choose, uh, I want to use velocity. I'll select the define. And then I have a spreadsheet with velocities, which I believe have been already deconvoluted. So it can be applied to the bottom of the model to generate the proper surface uh, time history of the earthquake. And then I'll come back to my model and I'll paste, I'll paste my values. So I've pasted my time history. I'll select OK. And then I'll choose compliant base and I'll select OK. And that has defined the dynamic load, but I now need to apply it. So now I'll go to add dynamic load. That is the name of the load. I'm applying it to stage six and I'm going to apply it. I select OK and I'm applying it to the base. And I'll hit enter and save it. And now I can run this and get a seismic history results. And we're going to see the results at the time intervals I specified. That takes that would take me about two hours to get these results. But we could do that and we'll send you the results. Anybody who is interested, you can use it for your records. So this is how we can use RS2 to look at the numerical uh, to analyze the stability and the performance and behavior of TSFs. So I hope that this short discussion at least has sown the seeds for you to try these tools on your TSFs. And kindly let us know if you have any thoughts and you want to know more about how to use them. And we'll gladly help you to do that. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat and we will answer them. Now, I'll just make two quick uh, announcements. I'll give you two quick announcements while we wait for questions. The first announcement is Rock Science is organizing a training conference at the, uh, for, for Los Angeles. So there's going to be a slope stability workshop at the Los Angeles conference. So we encourage you to register. There are still spots available. So please go and book your spots. And I hope we'll see many of you there. Then the second one is for everyone who has participated in this webinar. We have your... Um, we have your details and Sayona has just posted a course um, details in the chat. So I encourage you to go explore those details and register for the course. But for everybody who is attending this webinar, we are having a special promotion for RS2. So if you are interested, just send an email to marketing at rockscience.com. So the email address is marketing at rockscience.com. Just send them an email, express your interest and they will work with you to give you a discount for your RS2 purchase. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to questions in the chat. I'm going through them to see. I haven't seen any questions yet. But please, if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat. And if you do not have any questions, then once again, Thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in Los Angeles. We look forward to you taking advantage of the special promotion for webinar attendees. And we also look forward to seeing you in uh, all the, oh, there are questions in the questions, sorry. All right, thanks Ali Reza for pointing that out. But we also look forward to seeing you at the North Sun webinar. We'll announce the details. Okay, I've seen a question. Uh -huh. um, yes. You can do the reverse. It's not just reducing the phreatic surface with time. It could also be a rapid increase in the water table with time. Absolutely. You can do that with a software. Yes, easily. You can apply a quick water table and then uh, you know, change the boundary conditions, take it away, and you see the influence. So you can increase it. That can be that. Reginald, can I answer another question? 
Sure, please but, go ahead. Uh, so Kamal is asking what is the solid tolerance in numerical analysis and how does it affect the calculation? So uh, this tolerance that we have it for both solid and also groundwater analysis is uh, 1 e minus 3, which is uh, normalized for the out of balance force or out of balance energy you have in the system. So it is tested, verified, and uh, we trust this 1 e minus 3 number for the tolerance threshold. Uh, if you change that one, if you go for lower values like 1 e minus 4, so the accuracy is going to be higher in the results that you are getting, but the number of iteration that you will need to get to that number, to that level of accuracy is going to be higher. And you might run into some uh, non-convergence warning problems. If you go for lower values like 1 e minus 2, 1 e minus 1, then you are getting to the results or convergency faster, but however, you are losing your accuracy. The values that we have there for maximum number of iteration and also the tolerance, we have tested it for um, so many simulations, so many verifications. And we trust those number. Uh, we recommend our user to use those numbers. If you would like to change them, uh, it is available to you. The option is there. You can change them, but be very careful with those numbers. All right. Uh, thanks, Ali Reza. Uh, somebody has said the limit equilibrium method and FEM critical slip surfaces are quite different. So that was something I was going to show that I didn't show. But let me just go to that. That was the first um, method. So what you can do is let me plot. Sorry, Ali Reza, did you want to say something else? No, go ahead. Okay. Let me show maximum shear strains, for example. And let me stop the deformed contours. Uh, okay. And let me go. Let's here. Yeah, so we see the formation of the failure mechanism. I can go to limit equilibrium analysis in uh, slide two. And this is the Spencer factor safety uh, surface, critical surface. I can copy. When you choose copy slide modular format, you've copied that surface. Now I can go to interpret and I can go to edit and paste from slide interpret. And there you go. So you can see, you can try and see how well it matches or deviates from your limit equilibrium analysis. So yes, in the lower part, the toe area, they match well, but coming up in this particular example, they diverge, but that's not always the case. So that's an interesting thing that calls for more consideration. But remember, when I imported, I just use the default mesh. Sometimes I can refine the mesh in uh, RS2 just to check and see whether that leads to significant changes from what I actually saw up front. So that's something you can check in RS2 quite easily. Now let me go to, yes, a recording of the webinar will be made available. So yes, we'll post a recording of this webinar on our website. Next question. Okay, some will send. Excess pore pressures. So when we go to earthquake, absolutely. Once I run it, but I don't have the results yet. So that's why I said it takes a while. But once you go there, yes, you can see excess pore pressures due to the earthquake. You can see that. So that is available. Absolutely correct. Um, you know, good question. Next. Okay. Please, I just thank you. Yes, we will post the lecture. We said that. The reference stage. So like I said, when you run shear strength reduction analysis, it automatically sets the lowest um, reduction factor as the reference stage. So that's the stage where displacements, this refers to total displacement, all displacements are set to zero. Now, it does not mean that there were no displacements for that stage. If you want to remove the reference, you can go to the data menu option, go to stage settings and say you don't want a reference stage, for example. So if you remove that and then you can see the actual displacements for that stage. So that reference stage is uh, something that you can play with and change. Okay. Um, I'm trying to read through the question. Um, somebody asked about the critical reduction divided by is the displacement at a critical, maybe a smaller round of the displacement of the SRA. Typically, what happens is and this is another thing you can do. You can graph your shear strength reduction results. That's another interesting tool you use very often. So when you don't have any reduction, you had a displacement, maximum displacement of about 0 0.6 meters. And it generally remains in this range. It's not that much higher. But as soon as things get unstable, you accumulate large displacement. And so the critical reduction factor is the last factor that gives you a stable configuration. Right after that, everything goes unstable. You get large displacement. So 
we always say, or one of the things we say is, if you are monitoring, that's why we do the difference. Um, if this is the reference stage, then when you subtract, you just get how much displacement you see on top of that to begin to realize that things are getting critical. And then you know at what point you may be getting into instability. But at least you get an idea of that from this chart. So hopefully I've answered that question. Uh, solid tolerance, Ali Reza, you've uh, answered that. And another thank you. Will there be a session for an MSC type structure? I'm sure you've given us a good idea. So yes, we will definitely commit to having an MSC type. If we already don't have that, Ali Reza, don't we have something already to the best of your knowledge? Uh, we will arrange it. If even we don't have it, we will do that. So we'll do it. Be assured we're going to have one. Why do I get very high displacement ranges in my RS2 models? It, a lot depends on the stiffness parameters that you are inputting. So if your stiffness parameters are realistic, match what your real soils and rocks behave, your displacement should be in the range that you should expect. If they are too low, you'll get a lot of displacements. I suspect the high displacements are coming because of the Young's modulus in your models. But please let us know, send us an example. We are willing to take a look at it and let you know um, where things, what considerations we need to make to get more realistic results. I suspect that one of the things is, you may not be seeing that as being very realistic. Sure, we can take a look at that and help you. Do you have a guidance on how to set the fluid stiffness to get poor pressure generation and the loading? Um, this is something that, Ali Reza, I don't know whether you have something to say on that. Uh, so uh, the fluid stiffness, yes, the bulk modulus of fluid is an input to program, but uh, because we are dealing with water in most cases, we don't recommend people to change that unless they have different kind of fluid in the domain, maybe you want, they want to change that. But it's a constant value that we have it uh, in the uh, groundwater tab in the advanced options, if you would thought uh, project setting, groundwater in the advanced section. If you can, you want to change it, uh, you want to see what it is, change it, it's there. Uh, there are more questions here, uh, Reginald, we can actually take them all and uh, answer them, email the people that sure. are asking them, and uh, we can actually conclude this webinar if you are okay with that. Yes, we'll definitely do that. I think it's just uh, one left on that thing. And so whatever it is, we are going to give you written responses, and we'll send it to everybody who participated in in the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, see you guys later in uh, other webinars or in-person courses that we will have. I appreciate All it. All right. Thank you. And we look forward to your participation in the Norsant um, webinar. Thank you guys so much. Ladies and gents, you've been great. All the best. We look forward to interacting with you as we go along this interesting journey of applying numerical models to TSFs. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful remainder of the day. Bye-bye.